Hello everyone, welcome to the third part of part one of our lecture on Eurasian empires. We're following on part two of part one, uh, which was a discussion of Persia. We now turn eastward for a discussion of China and China's first empires, the Hin, the Qin, excuse me, and the Han empires. In effect, they're the same empire, just two different dynasties. And I'll explain that here as we go along. But the new Qin Empire was announced with a grand declaration. A new age is inaugurated by the emperor, it read. Rules and measures are rectified. The myriad things are set in order. Human affairs are made clear, and there is harmony between fathers and sons. The emperor in his sagacity, benevolence, and justice. And so we're sort of used to this kind of thing, this sort of imperial boast, you might say, whenever we see uh, empires on the move. And in this case, the beginning of a brand new empire in China, where you have an imperial authority now making claims on all matters of governance and uh, harmony, even, as it says here, between fathers and sons. And that reminds us of the Confucian influence in China, that is, the teachings of the sage Confucius. Uh, started with the basic unit of the family as the smallest sort of form of government. And so from the governing of the family to the governing of the empire, uh, this new Chinese emperor wanted to get all bases covered. Human affairs, he says, made clear. The myriad things set in order. And yeah, these kinds of claims, these kinds of boasts um, will be common to the sort of, um, you know, grand imperial uh, edicts that we'll see emanating from Persia, from China, from Rome. And heck, from the United States for that matter. Uh, we've recently had a president, uh, as we all know, who liked to make very grand claims of his own. Now, set in stone uh, in the Emperor Qin's uh, gravesite, uh, that is the first uh, emperor of China, the Emperor Qin. All the common people prosper. All men under the sky toil with a single purpose. Tools and measures are made uniform. The written script is standardized. There's a lot going on here too. Um, uh, forget about the common people prospering for a second. That sounds like a political campaign slogan to me. Uh, but this business of tools and measures are made uniform. The written script, it says, is standardized. Referencing here what the inscription says is a single purpose. And that does tell us something about empire and Chinese empire uh, as well. And that is to say that emperors generally become the uh, sort of expressive font for unification of consolidation of power of governance uh, that is the claim made by an emperor often seeks to bring all the affairs of this great landed territory uh, with its expanding boundaries and it's, uh, you know, it's governing authority uh, to bring it in line with some kind of central purpose or even a kind of uniform uh, measurement. When he says tools and measures are made uniform, he's talking about the way distances are traveled or the way certain manufacturing um, standards are upheld. In fact, what it reminded me of a lot here, this idea of tools made uniform, you know, after World War II, the United States will engage briefly in a competition with, with England over setting a standard for uh, screw threads. That is, uh, for all uh, screws and bolts uh, made to adhere internationally 
to a certain standard of thread so that in any place a particular screw a particular uh, bolt uh, would fit the particular grooves of uh, uh, whatever it is that you were attempting to attach um, now that is at the level of extreme detail wouldn't you say uh, to the extent that you've ever spent a lot of time staring at a screw or the threads uh, that wind their way up it. But this is the sort of thing that empires do uh, because that kind of control, that kind of authority, uh, in this case over things that are made, things that are bought and sold and traded, uh, you know, representing economic value, of course, that allows the governing entity to keep its hand in the respective uh, you know cookie jars as it were now here's a map showing the boundaries first of the chin empire you see the red line that follows through up here toward the korean peninsula and across the boundary with the uh, uh, steps the asian steps to the north uh, kind of circling back around in the heart of that area would have been your traditional heart of China that is where the yellow and Yangtze rivers come close to meeting here from that point basically east that would have been the original heart of China in the pre-imperial age uh, that is in the long period stretching all the way back to the third millennium BCE so more than 2,000 years of pre-Chinese or pre-imperial Chinese history, I should say. So what begins to happen now in the age of empire? As you can see, the boundaries are expanding. And with the successor dynasty, the Han dynasty, the empire will expand westward here as well. And we'll talk about that uh, later. Keep in mind that this is a, a border zone. And this region here in the green represents the pastoral, the lands of the pastoral people known as the Xiongnu by the, uh, by the Chinese. That's what the Chinese called them. They were herders and horsemen. They were raiders. Um, and they were a constant pain, you might say, in the imperial backside of the Chinese. And you might already be thinking, well, hey, why not build a wall? Well, guess what? Famously, that's exactly what the Chinese are going to do. Again, reminding us of more recent events in the United States with yet a different imperial claim made on a different border wall. Here are the dates of both the Qin and the Han dynasties. Together, you might say, they represent the first great imperial age of China. So beginning in 221 down to 220 CE, the Qin first and then Han dynasties will govern China. You notice here, this was only 11 years. Why is that? Because it was the Qin emperor who embodied that first imperial dynasty. And when he dies, he is not able to procure a, a successor or heir to continue in his name. And thus, uh, during a time uh, when interests compete for the throne, the Han will emerge victorious and take up the reins then after a, a brief um, interim period of five years or four years, take up the reign now for the next 400 years. If we look at it from an aerial view above, I've marked out the relative positions here of the two empires we're studying, the Persian Empire to the west and the Chinese or Qin and Han Empire to the east and so you can kind of get a sense of how they related to one another both in terms of extent and positioning along that axis of the Eurasian continent. Uh, the Persian Empire was greater in terms of extent uh, that is sheer size but the uh, Chinese Empire will win out when it comes to duration. Centuries of feuds had preceded the rise of the first Chinese Empire. Centuries of feuds between aristocratic clans during what was known as the era of warring states. And it will be the ultimate victor in that long running period of civil war that will lay claim then to the first Chinese imperial dynasty. His name was King Xiong. And he came from the province of Qin, 
the western province of Qin, uh, and it was his kingdom, the strongest of the seven warring states, that ended the civil war in 221 BCE. So from the confusion and tumult of a civil war will emerge a strongman leader, the king of Qin, a man by the name of Zhang. Uh, and as soon as he's able to declare himself now the first emperor of China, or Huangdi, that is his imperial title, Shi Huangdi is the emperor of heaven. So he gives himself a promotion, you might say, as victory uh, in the civil wars uh, establish his, his basic claim. He will invest himself now with the first great uh, imperial titles, including Huangdi, the emperor of heaven. And that's sort of uh, typical, you know, for, for emperors in history to claim both the sacred and the temporal powers are now unified in their rule. That is, the things of heaven and the things of earth are now reconciled. And I tell you, it was a, a not unsuccessful formula because what begins now with the Emperor Qin, as we call him, or Shi Huangdi, uh, will last for the better part of 2100 years. That is 2100 years. The last of the Chinese emperors claiming the title of Huangdi uh, would be in 1911 in the 20th century. So yeah, what, what he started, the imperial tradition he started, will be wildly successful in historical terms lasting more than 2000 uh, years. Uh, there's an artist's depiction uh, of the man with his full imperial title, Qin Shi Huangdi. How we de depict leaders, how we depict emperors, whether it be in, you know, in, in painted form or in sculpture, uh, often has everything to do with the kind of branding or marketing or labeling, if you will, on the imperial claim. So the resplendent robes, but you know he also carries a battle sword which reminds you that you know he is also then a military man um, it all adds up to a grand image subsequent military campaigns led by Qin extended Chinese boundaries south to Vietnam and north to Korea westward toward the barbarian peoples of the Zhongyu Confederation we looked on the map a minute ago at that dark area in the north uh, the peoples the Chinese called the Xiongnu. They were a, a, a Turkic and Mongolian uh, pastoral people, uh, the native peoples of the northern steppes. They were herders and horsemen and raiders and soldiers. And as I say, they were uh, a constant pain in the imperial backside. And it will because, be because the Emperor Qin wants to create a defensible perimeter to the north that he orders the building of what becomes the Great Wall. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Yeah, from the chaos of civil war, from the claims of imperial sovereignty, and from the vision of an expansive Chinese empire, we can now say that for the first time in history, in China's long history, that China was born. <laughs> and you know, what do I mean by it? Well, China existed in a sense before this, but not as we know China today, even though the Chinese don't call themselves any longer an empire. Uh, the China we know today with its global interests and its vast uh, power holding in, in Asia was really born of, of this period. China prior to this time uh, existed only as a kind of patchwork of different and competing kingdoms. But now we have something like a unified China in history. A quick and brutal campaign of unification and centralization is what brought this out from the western state of Qin, as I said. The new emperor, according to one of his chroniclers, had emerged off the frontier almost like some modern cowboy hero. Quote, cracking his long whip, he drove the universe before him. That's another lesson of empires. Have good public relations. 
Have people write biographies. Have scholars and scribes testify to your greatness. Upon his death, the Qin Emperor even had himself buried, as we know, with 7,000 man army of life-size terracotta soldiers and horses. We looked at this at the very beginning of the lecture, the famous imperial tomb of the Emperor Qin, which was rediscovered in the 1970s, uh, is one of the great examples of monumental tomb building. Uh, I would even put it up there with the Egyptian pharaohs and their pyramids when you realize that every one of these 7,000 um, terracotta characters was uh, sculpted to an individual likeness, no two the same, right down to their battle armor and their tunics and their various, uh, you know, accoutrements. Uh, it's an extraordinary example of artistry and engineering. And so the question is, well, well, why? You know, why do emperors want to, why do, why do power figures including emperors, want to associate themselves with grandeur and greatness. Well, I think you understand, right? To impress upon the living, and in this case, even upon the dead, uh, the ultimate sort of source of, of imperial greatness and rule. But it takes more than a bunch of clay soldiers, you know. You, you can even conquer an empire, but can you govern it? You know, it's one thing to crack your long whip, but it's another thing once you've subjected your enemies and your rivals, you know, to, to get them to follow your rule, to abide by your rule. And uh, what we see here is a system of legal codes put into place now that will create a kind of framework of law and governing for China's expanding empire. And the basic philosophy behind it is one that we call legalism. Inspired by the writings of the Chinese scholar Han Fei, legalism was a ruling ideology that emphasized lawful authority of government and especially the ruler who firmly controls the state. Subjects that are expected to follow those established laws and, uh, and even going so far as to encode harsh punishments for lawbreakers. In some respects, legalism rejected the pacifism of, of Confucius, the great teachings of Confucius, though accepting Confucius's insistence that merit and talent and ability be rewarded over mere cronyism. You know cronyism, that's when you put all the biggest suck-ups and all your, your, your best friends into positions of power because you know they'll be loyal to you. So a little bit of that Confucian emphasis on merit then will also be incorporated into legalism as we'll see. But above all things, legalism is a, is a system of centralization in which authority flows from the top and obedience is returned from below. So a pretty harsh uh, uh, you know, governing set here of laws and statutes from the writings of Han Fei himself Let's let him explain it. The means whereby the intelligent ruler controls his ministers are two handles only. The two handles are chastisement and commendation. What are meant by chastisement and commendation? To inflict death or torture upon cul culprits is called chastisement. To bestow encouragements or rewards on men of merit is called commendation. Well, that's that's pretty clear. Um, follow the law and you're commended. Violate the law and you are punished. This is the basic framework then of Chinese legalism throughout the first uh, phase of China's imperial rule. There are many aspects to governing but one that becomes familiar throughout all empires. We've already seen it in the case of Persia with the gold derrick. Now we see it in China uh, in the era of the Qin, the coinage. And by the way, it doesn't look like much here because over time the copper has become colored and corroded. 
but these were originally shiny Chinese coins uh, and they bore the imperial imprint of the Qin Emperor. You know, why do governments do this? Why do they invest their own authority in that, say, of a currency or a coinage system? You know, why, when you look on an American dollar bill, you know, does it have all the, the seals of the government, you know, and the historical figures associated with governing? case of the bill, the dollar bill, of course, George Washington. Well, uh, because, again, to effectively administer and to profit from administering a large state, a uh, landed state, such as an empire, requires a government to have a kind of vested economic governing authority uh, so that all roads, once again, lead back, in effect, to the capital, to the emperor, to the governing entity. And what better way to do that than to knit the material interests of people, uh, that is, the, the coins they carry in their purses and pocketbooks, to the governing authority itself. During the Qin Dynasty, reforms were undertaken and carried out to further unify and centralize. And that gets us back to the issue of walls. The Emperor Qin ordered, in fact, that the ancient walls of Chinese kingdom states on that northern boundary that had been originally local walls, that they be connected now into one great wall that could defend the entire northern perimeter of the new territorial state. The Romans will be wall builders. The United States and its recent administration had returned to the theme of a wall between the United States uh, and Mexico on the southern boundary. And so our question, you know, at the beginning of this, this lecture was, are we Rome? We could also say, are we China when it comes to building walls? Well, I'm not sure the wall on the southern boundary of the U.S. is ever going to come close to anything like the Great Wall of China, after all. But there is a kind of common thread then through history. And as we'll see when we talk about the Romans, the Romans likewise built walls. And so we need to ask you know, the obvious question, why? What is it about boundaries and empires that, that require these sorts of undertakings? And as, as you recall in that first lecture, the first part, we defined an empire, we said a kind of obsessive concern with boundaries. Because as boundaries expand, more and more of the people that come under your authority are not people like yourself. They may not speak your language, not your same ethnicity, or even recognize you as any kind of relation at all. And so this, this obsessive need to administer within and secure borders uh, on the exterior edges is part of the burden that empires um, inherit. And when I say burden, I mean it, because they're expensive, they, they cause hard feelings, uh, they often incite hostility, and they require you to basically maintain, defend, observe, enforce, and uh, patrol them. And all of that requires additional layers of bureaucracy and staffing and expense. And yet it was something that the Emperor Qin insisted be carried out. And to eliminate corruption, looking at the boundaries within, the Emperor Qin divided China into 36 districts, each with a military and civilian governor. And the precept of legalism, the law does not fawn on the noble. Whatever the law applies to the wise cannot reject, nor can the brave defy. Punishment for fault never skips, ministers. Reward for good never misses, commoners. So if we break that statement down, there's a kind of broad, almost egalitarian tone to it. No one is above the law. No one escapes the law. Uh, just because you're a nobleman doesn't mean you'll be excused, nor if you are a commoner will you miss being rewarded for your good behavior. Now, at least in theory, that was the idea. And that still kind of contains that uh, element of Confucius thought there, that again, you're rewarding loyalty. You're rewarding merit instead of just imposing brute power. China's written script was standardized into a common form to help with all of this, still used today, uh, overcoming the myriad legal or regional dialects 
and local scripts. The idea was to have one written script uh, for the entire imperial domain. And whenever you see this little symbol right here, that's what you're looking at, the Chinese script character uh, for China. Even the axle length of merchants' carts was standardized. You know, and I think about this sometimes when I'm driving, say, down the interstate, and you see the truck scales and the trucks lined up on the side of the road. Well, think of this ordinance here. The imperial decree that the length of merchants' carts had to all be standardized. Well, on the one hand, that was a practical measure that would make the building of roads and, and cart tracks uh, you know, more effective. But it also, once again, allowed the emperor to reach his, his long arm into the pocketbooks of commerce and trade and the merchant's business. Uh, because just like those truck scales, if you can, say, weigh the goods that are being carried, you can then tax them. You can control interstate trade, in this case, something like it in ancient China. Following the Emperor Qin's death, a new ruling dynasty emerged. And, you know, before I get into the Han Dynasty, let me just suggest here, well, you know, what sort of the big picture is what we're discussing. You know, on the one hand, we could spend a lot more time on the Chinese tomb, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't begrudge us that, you know, because it's fascinating. Um, you know, it's like talking about ancient Egypt. You can spend more time talking about the pyramids, right? Or, you know, and looking at Persia, you know, the, the Persian immortals or something. And these are the sorts of, of themes that, that writers and artists and poets and others strike upon. So what am I here doing now, plotting through, you know, the minutia of axle carts and tax policies and, you know, boundary walls and that kind of thing. And it's because, you know, ultimately... The really sexy stuff, the exciting stuff, you know, that goes into conquest, those are not the same criteria by which empires then actually govern and and extend their life spans, if you will. In other words, it's not so much the dashing soldiers on horseback, you know, that will ultimately determine the success of an empire. It's the bureaucrats, the lawgivers, um, the civil servants, you know, that take on the burden of essentially uh, governing on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. So yeah, I, you know, I spend time talking about this stuff. I recognize that it's not as inherently thrilling, but if what we want to do is understand the world we live in, then we got to come to terms with the bureaucrats too. So here's the Han signature. The Han dynasty will succeed the Qin dynasty, but carry on many of the same policies with some uh, revision. Certainly the new Han rulers will restore some of the aristocratic privileges taken by the Qin emperor uh, that is taken away from China's aristocrats by the Qin emperor and thus lessen the discontent among the nobles. There was a lot of grumbling under the Emperor Qin, though none really dared to challenge him directly. Uh, there was a lot of discontent and grumbling among the nobles because of the standardization and the draw of power away from their traditional claims. Uh, the Han will give some of those privileges back in exchange for loyalty, in exchange for support of governing. The Han will manage to continue their dynasty, after all, for 400 years. The Emperor Qin lasted only 11 years. So this kind of attention to detail, you know, uh, will help the Han endure uh, for centuries. They'll conduct diplomacy even with the enemies to the north, the so-called Zhongyu tribesmen to the north, going so far as to use marriage, arranged marriages, to cement alliances with some of their more powerful clan leaders. These are the same tribal peoples of the steppe, after all, who would centuries uh, on range far west and even evade the borders of the Roman Empire. By the way, the Han Empire and the Roman Empire are roughly contemporary to one another. And during that period, uh, you'll see the advance of Asiatic 
uh, pastoral peoples all the way into to Europe. Uh, the Romans called them the Hun, but they uh, emerged from that same vast confederacy of tribes and clans that the Chinese called the Xiongnu. So we're starting to see here some very long range uh, kinds of connections between states. And in this case, a kind of intermediary, intermediary people, the Xiongnu, that will actually manage to kind of connect China and China's interests with the Roman Empire and Roman interests in the West. Um, what do we want to say? Many of the Qin administrative reforms were kept. OK, fair enough. But Confucian scholars were once again brought in by the Han as advisors to the emperor. Yeah, the, the Confucian schools did not get drawn upon during the Qin uh, ruling period, the, the 11 years. Uh, not a long time to wait. I mean, it pays to be patient in these things. And, and, and the patience of the Confucian scholars, who really represented the dominant school of governing uh, education uh, that is training scholars to serve and you know in Chinese government will be brought back into prominence now as advisors to the Emperor and again that's a tradition that's going to last for the next 2,000 years. The Han emperors also look beyond China's boundaries uh, not just to the north and the Xiongnu but to the west as well for trade possibilities uh, and will send emissaries and diplomats uh, figures like uh, Xian Shang who famously because he wrote about his travels between 138 and 126 BCE uh, Xian Shang will write about his travels to the western regions and talk about what becomes ultimately the pioneering efforts to create what we'll know as the Silk Road and the Silk Road as a name is a little bit misleading. It's never a single road. It's never something like an interstate highway or anything like that. But what it is is a kind of diplomatic and commercial effort to connect all the various trading zones of Western China and Central Asia, eventually as far as Europe, you know, with uh, some kind of, of overlap, basically, so that goods, commodities, people, um, caravans, and as we'll see, ideas, culture, religion uh, can pass across these great distances, these great spaces. And so that's part of what China is helping to foster now. And here's a, a cave mural from Western China, a set of famous murals in, in Western China that were uh, painted uh, on the uh, interior walls of mountain caves showing the travels of Jean Jean himself. Uh, he's the guy on the horse. His party, uh, his retainers, well, they had, it looks like they had to walk on foot, you know, so be it. But it's his writings of his connections then with peoples beyond China's borders that will become one of the first sort of global travel accounts. And here you can see some of the peoples uh, that China is connecting with the Xiongnu to the north, as we said, and then a variety of peoples through this Central Asian region here that will make up the core trading zones from Bactria to Sogjana here in the north, um, a kind of uh, you know global trading uh, emporium, a kind of commercial emporium being facilitated there in Central Asia with lots of interesting and fascinating and influential cross-cultural transfers. Let's listen to one of the reports written by Sean. Dayon, what he called Daiwan, uh, modern-day Uzbekistan, in other words, in Central Asia, lies, and you can see it on the map here, there's Daiwan, lies southwest of the territory of the Xiongnu, some 10,000 li that would be about 3,000 miles directly west of China. The people are settled on the land, plowing the fields and growing rice and wheat. They also make wine out of grapes. The people live in houses in fortified cities, there being some 70 or more cities of various sizes in the region. The population numbers several hundred thousand. And so this is impressive. Remember, this is in the second century BCE. This is 2200 years ago. 
when Central Asia was a place of more than 70 cities with agriculture and commerce and populations numbering in the several hundred thousand, according to Zhang Shang. And so that's a kind of snapshot, if you will, of a great global economic and cultural zone 2,200 years ago that China was very much interested in tapping into. So sometimes what we get from empires are views of a larger world. And part of that larger world now for China is going to be the reception of a powerful new religious tradition, powerful and new to China, but actually already quite old by the time it reaches them. And that, of course, is Buddhism with its roots in northern India. And you can see by the arrows here from northern India, Buddhism will stretch in all the compass directions, south to Sri Lanka, east to Southeast Asia, and even west to the lands of Western Asia. And in fact, scholars think that it was uh, Buddhist missionary efforts that reached uh, the Western uh, parts of the Asian continent uh, in Syria and Palestine that influenced early Christian acolytes in thinking about taking up missionary work of their own. And it's through this kind of expansive travel and missionary activity now that the great world religions that we saw sort of born in that axial age, you know, from the time of the Persians and the Hebrews and also the Buddhists and the Hindus uh, that we will see the beginnings of something like global religions. Now, in the case of Buddhism and China, there's a very interesting connection because Buddhism is being brought by way of the merchant roads across the mountain ranges uh, north of India into the desert plateaus on the western border of China. And here we see another one of those cave murals showing the Han Emperor Emperor Wu Di, one of the, the better known of the Han emperors, uh, the man who had sent Zhang Shang on his travels to the West, shows the emperor um, worshiping what was called the golden man. And to understand, now the emperor is here. He's the big guy in the picture. The golden man is in the shrine here, and you can just make him out. That was the Buddha, the Buddha statue. A Chinese emperor worshiping before a Buddhist statue. There is a current tradition that Emperor Ming dreamed that he saw a tall golden man, the top of whose head was glowing. He questioned his group of advisors, and one of them said, In the West there is a man called Buddha. His body is 16 chi high. That would be about 12 feet, by the way, and is the color of true gold. Now, that was from a chronicle uh, from the Han Dynasty, a historian by the name of Hu Hanshu, who in 70 CE relates an early appearance of Buddhism uh, in China. So, in the first couple of hundred years, Buddhism only makes a partial headway. But it does so critically by drawing the attention of Chinese imperial authorities. Before it ever becomes a popular religion in China, this northern Indian import must undergo its own sort of transformation into Chinese customs and folklore so that the feel of Buddhism now in China will evoke something Chinese. And we call this syncretism, of course, as in particular religions sort of uh, morph into different cultural variations, taking on characteristics of the places and peoples where they spread. And this is something that we see in all world religions. And we see it certainly in China with the kind of, uh, you know, transformation of this once northern Indian religion into something more recognizably Chinese. Even the Buddhist statues themselves will come to look more Chinese. But this was an important connection culturally to the outside world for an expansive uh, Han Empire because it gave the emperor a kind of claim over a well-established and highly regarded now system of religious teachings and practices that could be embedded into Han imperial 
uh, practice itself. And from that point, then, you can see the beginning of, of sort of a popular Buddhism spread among the peasant people and common peoples of China, where it begins to merge and mesh with traditional Chinese folklore and custom. One other thing I'll say about the golden man is here in uh, Hao Hanshu's uh, chronicle, it says that there was a golden man the top of whose head was glowing and we've seen before the idea in the Persian tradition later borrowed by the Romans of the rays of light emanating from the head of the sage later on uh, Christian Europeans will use the image of the halo and even the Statue of Liberty as we said has those rays of light represented in that crown um, emanating from her head. So here we have rays of light emanating from the Buddha's head, which again is something associated with enlightenment uh, and wisdom. And that was something that the Chinese emperor also then wanted to uh, rub up against.